So, uh, Arjun, can you uh, can you hear us? Well? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hi. Okay. Okay. So, uh, shall we start uh, right away? Andrea. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Of course. So, of course. Uh, so today uh, our invited speaker is. Uh, professor John Hooker. So he is professor of uh, operations research and Jerome Hodder and professor of business ethics and social responsibility at Carnegie Mellon University. He holds uh, doctoral degrees in both philosophy and operations research. His primary research interests are logic based methods for optimization, constraint programming, mathematical analysis of distributive justice, ethics of AI and machine learning, business ethics, the ontological foundations for ethics, cross-cultural management and music theory. He's a pioneer in the integration of optimization and constraint programming technologies. And he introduced the logic-based vendors decomposition as you may remember uh, uh, from uh, earlier. So he has published over 200 articles, nine books, six edited volumes in operations research, constraint programming, ethics, cross-cultural management, and music theory. He's an INFORMS fellow and recipient of the INFORMS Computing Society Award, the INFORMS Kachian Award for Lifetime Achievements in Optimization, and the Research Excellence Award of uh, AC, uh, ACP. So today, uh, so we, we mentioned that he has contributed to logic-based methods for optimization, integration of optimization and constraint programming on the one hand, and also ethics on the other hand. So today, uh, John will uh, tell us about ethics and in particular, the use of logic for ethics. So uh, we are ready to listen to uh, John's talk, but uh, meanwhile, please feel free to ask your questions via chat at Zoom or via Slack. Okay, once you write down your questions, then uh, I will ask John uh, after, after the talk. So we are ready for the talk. Uh, Andrea, will you be able to stream it? Or uh, Hi, yes, I'm yes. John Hooker. And this is a talk on logic-based formulation of ethical principles. Some of this work is joint with Thomas Donaldson and my colleague at CMU, Taewon Kim. So as you're probably aware, there has been an exploding interest in AI and ethics. Most of this deals with avoiding bias in AI-based decisions, but there's also interest in incorporating general ethical principles into AI systems. This is sometimes known as value alignment. And the goal here is to show that ethical principles can be stated rigorously enough to allow a logic-based formulation of the principles that will require some background in deontological ethics, and then to show that this logic-based formulation enables value alignment to incorporate ethical principles. The argument is based on two assumptions. One is that when we act freely, we do so for a reason. There's always a rationale for our action. And the other is the universality of reason, which states that justification is independent of the reasoner. So the task here is to deduce ethical principles from these two assumptions. This is what is done in deontological ethics. The word deontology comes from the Greek for what is required. And the idea behind deontological deduction is that ethical principles represent what's required for the possibility of free action. So take the first premise. We always act for a reason. This assumption is made to distinguish freely chosen action from mere behavior. So you may be aware of the uh, ancient issue of how we can reconcile determinism and freedom. For example, uh, there have been experiments where people are put into an MRI machine and asked 
to decide at some point, say, to move their finger. Then the machine can detect that the subject is going to move a finger a couple of seconds before the decision is made to move the finger. In other words, the brain makes up one's mind before one makes up one's mind. So given this, how can our decisions be free? For the purposes of ethics, this is resolved by distinguishing two kinds of explanation, a biological cause and the agent's rationale for the action. Take an example, suppose I have the hiccups. This has only a biological explanation. It's not a freely chosen action. But if I decide to drink some water to stop the hiccups, then there are two kinds of explanation for that. There's the neurological explanation for that decision, and there's my reason, my rationale, for taking the drink of water. This makes it a freely chosen action as opposed to the hiccups themselves. This is something called a dual standpoint theory, which goes back to Kant. Maybe it doesn't fully resolve the problem of freedom and determinism, but it's good enough for the purposes of ethics. In fact, we're going to say that ethical principles are nothing more than necessary conditions for the logical coherence of an action's rationale. The other assumption is the universality of reason. It states that what is rational does not depend on who I am. I don't get to have my own logic. In particular, if I view a reason as justifying an action for me, I must view it as justifying the same action for anyone to whom the reason applies. I can't prove the universality of reason is true, but it's an assumption we always make in science and in fact all forms of rational inquiry. So again, the task here is to sketch some deontological arguments for ethical principles based on these assumptions. And the three principles we're going to use are generalization, autonomy, and utilitarian. Then we're going to show how to express these principles once they are made precise in the idiom of quantified modal logic. And this will allow us to apply principles in value alignment systems. To begin with the generalization principle, let's use an example. Suppose I walk into a shop and see some watches on display and decide I'd like to have one. So I steal one and put it in my pocket. I have two reasons for doing this. I'd like to have a new watch, and I'm pretty sure I won't get caught because security is lax in this shop. Now these are not psychological motivations for my theft. They are consciously adduced reasons for the theft. So if you ask me, why did you do that? I'm ready to supply the reasons. There may, of course, be other reasons, but to simplify matters, I'm going to suppose I have only these two. Now, due to the universality of reason, I am making a decision for everyone. I'm saying that anyone who wants a watch and think they won't get caught should steal it. Either the reasons are sufficient for the action or they're not. And if they are sufficient, it shouldn't matter who I am or what my address is. They are sufficient for anyone to whom the reasons apply. But I also know that if everyone else who has these reasons follows my policy, the shops will catch on to this and they will install more security. It will no longer be possible to get away with stealing watches. So the reasons for my theft will no longer apply, not even to me. Now, I'm not saying that people actually will steal watches when they have my reasons. I'm only saying that if they did, my reasons would no longer apply. In other words, my reasons are inconsistent with the assumption that people will act on them. I'm caught in a contradiction. I'm deciding if these reasons justify theft for me, but I'm not deciding that the same reasons justify theft for anyone else. I can't have it both ways. More generally, universal theft merely for personal benefit undermines the institution of property. And the purpose of theft is to benefit from property rights. So if you think about it, you know, why would I steal something? Because I want to be able to keep it and use it. But if there's no sense of property, no institution of ownership, then someone else will feel free to steal it from me two minutes later. 
So the ability to steal something and retain possession and use of it presupposes an institution of property, which in turn presupposes that people respect that institution. They don't steal things merely because they want them. So we can state the generalization principle like this. It would be rational for me to believe that the reasons for my action are consistent with the assumption that everyone to whom the same reasons apply acts the same way. Now, this has the flavor of Kant's famous categorical imperative, but actually it's somewhat different and it's more precise. You'll notice that all through this talk, I'm appealing to this idea of what's rational. I'm not defining rationality. I'm taking that as a primitive and unexplained notion. But then, isn't this what we do in essentially all of science? So let's take a few more examples. One is cheating. What's wrong with cheating on an exam? I've been teaching a long time, but my students have never been able to tell me exactly why cheating is wrong. Well, let's have a look at it. Why do I cheat? Well, because I'll get a better grade and a better job, and because I can get away with it. Now, I know that these reasons apply to most students, as long as they can get away with cheating. And I also know that if they act accordingly, well, grades will be meaningless, because everyone will have an A+, plus, or the university will crack down and the exams will be strictly proctored so that you can no longer get away with cheating. In other words, one or both of my reasons are defeated if people generally act on my reasons. This means that cheating for these reasons violates the generalization principle. There's a similar argument with agreements. Why is it wrong to break agreements simply for convenience or profit? Well, if people generally were to break agreements, simply when it's convenient or profitable to do so, then that would break down the institution of making agreements and contracts. It would be impossible to make agreements. That means it would be impossible to achieve one's purposes by breaking an agreement. After all, if you think about it, the whole point of having an agreement is that you keep it when you don't want to keep it. Another example is lying. Lying for mere convenience violates the generalization principle, assuming that the lie will work only if people will believe it. So suppose that I decide to lie just whenever it's convenient, just to get me through the day. And everyone did this when it's convenient. Then no one would believe the lies. In fact, the possibility of communication in general presupposes a certain amount of credibility so casual lying, if generalized, defeats the purpose of that lying and is therefore not generalizable. Now, when people hear this argument, they almost invariably bring up the tragic example of Anne Frank and her family. They hid away in an Amsterdam office building during the Nazi era. And when the police came knocking on the door, the occupants of the building would tell them, we have no idea where the Franks are hiding. Of course, they lied. Well, this is generalizable. If you look at the reasons for lying, it's to conceal the whereabouts of the Frank family. If everyone were to lie in cases like this, where fugitives are trying to hide from a brutal Nazi regime, if everyone lied in that case, saying they have no idea where the fugitives are, it would still achieve the purpose of concealing the whereabouts of the fugitives. The police probably wouldn't believe the lies, but they don't have to believe it. That's not part of the purpose. So lying in a case like this is generalizable. Now we have to be sure that we state the reasons for an action in full generality. Suppose, for example, that an ambulance driver is late picking up his kids at daycare because he misplaced his car keys. And if he uses the siren, he can get through the traffic quickly and allow him to arrive on time. And he thinks he can get away with this, even though there's no patient in the back of the ambulance. Well, this is generalizable, because this is a situation that occurs very rarely, maybe once or twice a year in a given city. So if all ambulance drivers, to whom these reasons apply, were to use the siren illegitimately, then it would still be possible to get away with doing it and achieve one's purposes. The problem, of course, is that the scope 
of the rationale is too narrow. These details are not necessary to justify using the siren. Suppose the ambulance driver were late for some other reason. Would it matter to his rationale? Why no. The true reason that he wants to use the siren is that it's important to arrive on time. Obviously, if ambulance drivers always did this, whenever it was important for them to arrive on time when they're late, they just turned on the siren, then the public would be on to this, and they would simply ignore ambulance sirens, and as a result, using the siren would no longer achieve its purpose. So it's important to state the rationale in full generality before applying the ethical tests. Now a bit of formalism. Since actions always have a rationale, we can always treat them as action plans, that is, as conditional statements, if X, then do Y. So, for example, if I would like to have an item on display in shop and I can get away with stealing it, then I'll steal it. And we can regard an agent as a bundle of action plans. This is what you decide when you decide how to act. You adopt an action plan, and these plans are executed when the antecedents are satisfied. Now, to formulate the generalization principle, we first notate an action plan like so. So the action plan of the thief would be, if conditions C1 and C2 are satisfied, then that agent will undertake the action of stealing. The double arrow here is not logical entailment. It simply indicates that agent A regards these two conditions as justifying the action. We will use a couple of modal operators. The box means that agent A must assent to statement S to be rational, or as I'll often say, the agent is rationally constrained to believe S. It's irrational not to believe it. And the diamond means that the agent can be rational in believing S. Now these are not the interpretations of the operators you see in traditional alethic, uh, epistemic, and doxastic logics. For example, box S doesn't imply S, as it does in most of these logics. I'm also going to use a possibility predicate. P of S means that S is possibly true. Possibility is not interpreted here as a modal operator, and it's not really important to be very precise about what kind of possibility we mean. We can think about it as physical possibility. Then the generalization principle says the following. The agent A can rationally believe, that's the diamond, that it's possible, that's the P, to take an action A when reasons C apply, that's C of A and A of A, and all agents X to whom the reasons apply take action A. Moving on to autonomy, we recognize a fundamental obligation to respect autonomy. For example, we generally believe it's wrong to murder someone, usually to coerce someone, to enslave someone, and so forth. But we must define autonomy carefully. For one thing, even though the word autonomy comes from the Greek from self-law, it's more than self-determination. I act autonomously when I freely make up my own mind about what to do based on coherent reasons I give for my decision. In other words, autonomy presupposes reasons responsiveness. This means that an autonomous car is not actually autonomous, because the car can't explain to you why it did that. Now, when does coercion violate autonomy? Not always. It violates autonomy if it interferes with an ethical action plan. This is why we're talking about action plans. Suppose, for example, I have an action plan. If I want to catch a bus and the bus stop is across the street and no cars are coming, then I'll cross the street. Now, if you come and pull me off the street forcibly when no cars are coming, that's a violation of my autonomy because it's inconsistent with my action plan. It interferes with my plan. On the other hand, if there is a car coming and I don't see it, and you forcibly pull me out of the path of the car, then that's also coercion, but it's no violation of autonomy because it doesn't interfere with my action plan. It's part of my action plan that I won't cross the street if there's a car coming. 
So we could state the autonomy principle something like this. My action plan is unethical if I'm irrationally constrained to believe it interferes with the ethical action plan of some other agent. Now, notice that I must be rationally constrained to believe that there is a conflict between the action plans. I'll give an example of this. Suppose I'm working under the street and I leave the cover off the manhole. Well, someone comes along and falls in, which is a, seems to be a violation of autonomy because this person is injured. Yet it's only possible or probable that someone will fall into the hole. There's no necessary contradiction between my action plan of leaving the hole uncovered and some pedestrian's action plan of walking down the street without having an accident. Now, this will be a violation of the utilitarian principle, which we talk about later, but it's not a violation of the autonomy principle. On the other hand, suppose that I put a cover on the hole that's actually a piece of cardboard that will collapse when everyone steps on it, and suppose the manhole is in the middle of Fifth Avenue in New York City, which is crowded with pedestrians, then I'm absolutely sure that someone will step on the cover and fall into the hole. In other words, it's a booby trap. I'm rationally constrained to believe there's a contradiction between my action plan of covering the hole with cardboard and a pedestrian's action plan of walking down Fifth Avenue without injury. So this is a violation of autonomy. Also, coercion does not violate autonomy if there is informed consent. Suppose, for example, I attend a concert that has strict rules against recording the performance. Nonetheless, I want to record the performance on my phone. So I do so, and the ushers come and compel me to leave. This is coercion, but it's not a violation of my autonomy, because I'm giving informed consent to the possibility of being expelled from the concert. That consent is part of the antecedent of my action plan. My plan is actually, if I want to record the performance and I'm not kicked out for doing so, then I will record it. The authors are not interfering with that action plan. Finally, interference with an unethical action plan is not a violation of autonomy. And the simple reason that an unethical action plan has no coherent rationale. That's what ethical means. And if it has no coherent rationale, it's not freely chosen action. Interference with an action plan of this kind is not a denial of agency, so we don't have a violation of the autonomy principle. This means that you can defend yourself if someone tries to attack you, because attacking you is unethical because it's a violation of your autonomy. Now you may sense a circularity here, and there is a circularity. But what's going on here is that we define unethical recursively. That is to say, an action plan is unethical if it violates the generalization or utilitarian principle or interferes with an ethical action plan. So the recursion starts with a violation of the generalization or utilitarian principle. Now, Let's formulate interference between action plans in modal logic. So we have two action plans of agents A and B, as shown. And A's action plan interferes with B's if the following is true. Agent A is rationally constrained to believe, that's the box, rationally constrained to believe that it's not possible for the two actions both to occur. That's the P. Also, Agent A can rationally believe that it is possible for the reasons of the two actions both to apply. If those two conditions are satisfied, then we have interference. And I'll give you examples. Here's an example. Going back to the bus stop. Suppose Agent A has a plan of pulling Agent B off the street when there are no cars coming. 
So agent A's action plan is as shown, as is agent B's. Agent A is saying, if no cars are coming, and agent B is about to cross the street, then I will pull the agent off the street. And agent B is saying, if I want to catch a bus, and there's a bus stop across the street, and there's no cars coming, then I will cross the street. We do have interference because we can check the two conditions. The first one is that agent A must be rationally constrained to believe that the two actions are incompatible. Well, they obviously are, so there is, it would be irrational to deny that. Also, agent A can rationally believe that the conditions for these two action plans are mutually compatible. And they are. It's possible for all four of these conditions to be true. Now, suppose Agent A decides to pull Agent B off the street when a car is coming. Okay, so Agent A's action plan is a little different. Now, part of the antecedent is that a car is coming. Okay, in this case, there's no violation of autonomy because there's no interference with B's action plan. And we can check the two conditions. The first condition with the box is satisfied as before, but the second condition is not satisfied. A cannot believe rationally that the conditions in the two antecedents can all be true, if only because there is a logical contradiction among them. Now, what is the source of this autonomy principle deontologically? As you can see, it's a rather long story. I've outlined the argument here. You can come back and look at this later if you're interested. But the gist of the argument is that we are recognizing that when you make a decision, when you adopt an action policy, you are adopting it for the whole world. As Kant said, when you make a decision to act, it's as though you are legislating for the whole world. This is due to the universality of reason. Also, strictly speaking, we don't ethically evaluate individual action plans. Rather, we evaluate all of my action plans simultaneously for whether they are rational. This is true of beliefs in general, right? I'm a rational person only if all of my beliefs taken together rationally cohere, and it's the same for action plans. Then if you put these two considerations together, you deduce that I am irrational and therefore unethical if I adopt an action plan that's inconsistent with the action plans I attribute to others. Now let's move on to the utilitarian principle. This of course is due to Jeremy Bentham, who asked us to adopt actions that create the greatest good for the greatest number. Or more generally, we want to maximize total net expected utility. What's utility? Well, it's what we take to be inherently valuable. For Bentham and John Stuart Mill, it was happiness or pleasure. That means that utility is the ultimate end to which our actions are means. In other words, what's inherently valuable and not simply valuable because it's means to some other end. We must have an ultimate end for our actions, otherwise the reasons for our actions form an infinite regress. That is to say, I'm doing A because it's a means to B, and I'm doing B because it's a means to C, and so forth. There must be a termination of that sequence, or else we don't have a complete rationale. So here's the deontological argument for the obligation to maximize utility. Due to the universality of reason, if I regard an end as intrinsically valuable, then I must regard it as valuable for anyone. It shouldn't matter who I am. If I'm calling an end intrinsically valuable, then it's intrinsically valuable regardless of what my name or my hair color is. Well, we infer from that that since everyone's utility is intrinsically valuable to be consistent, I must take their utility as seriously as I take my own. Otherwise, I'm regarding their utility as different from mine. 
But I just acknowledge that it's not different. It's intrinsically valuable, just as it is for me. Now, this may not imply strict utility maximization, as in the classical theory. In fact, I think one can argue that there must be some degree of justice in the distribution of utility in order to preserve rationality. In fact, this is an argument that was used famously by John Rawls in his difference principle, which tells us that inequality is justified only to the extent that it maximizes the welfare of the worst off. Rawls' argument, by the way, only applied to social institutions and what he called primary goods, which are goods that any rational person would want. In any case, to simplify the discussion, I'm going to suppose for now that we are satisfying the utilitarian principle by maximizing utility. Now, people often bring up futility arguments to shed doubt on utilitarian principle. Suppose, for example, that I'm a guard at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, and my commanding officer orders me to torture a prisoner. As you probably know, this actually happened, not to me, but to some people at the prison. So I reason that if I refuse to obey orders, then the officer will simply get someone else to do it, and I'll be court-martialed. So the results will be the same, or even worse, if I refuse. So the utilitarian principle does not require me to disobey the order. This argument seems reasonable, but it also seems grotesque. To resolve the dilemma, we point out that torturing someone is a grievous violation of autonomy. So even though obeying the order here may pass the utilitarian test, it clearly violates autonomy and therefore is unethical. The fact that other people are willing to do it is irrelevant to the autonomy principle. What matters for autonomy is whether my action plan is inconsistent with the action plan of the prisoner, and certainly it is, if I'm a torturer. Now, to formulate the utilitarian principle, we use something we might call a social welfare function, an idea taken from welfare economics, to evaluate the expected utility distribution that results from an action plan. And we say that an action plan satisfies the utilitarian principle if the agent can rationally believe that the chosen action results in at least as much social welfare as any other ethical action that's available under the conditions stated by the antecedent of the action plan. You notice here that we're quantifying over action, so we have second order logic. Uh, but we can avoid this if we want by introducing some type of variables that uh, refer to actions. Notice that the agent need only be rational in believing that the action maximizes utility. We need not have a crystal ball and be able to predict exactly the consequences of our action. We must only be rational in believing that no other action would create greater utility. At this point, we are ready to use the logical formulation of ethical principles to integrate ethics with value alignment. Now, value alignment is usually conceived as incorporating human values into AI-based decision-making. A problem with this is that there is a systematic ambiguity in what's meant by values. It could refer to what humans actually prefer, or it could refer to what is preferable that is to what we should prefer. Value alignment is generally understood to use machine learning to identify human preferences as opposed to what humans should prefer. An example would be the moral machine developed at MIT's Media Lab. This is a system that uses machine learning to infer preferred driving behavior by presenting driving scenarios to thousands of drivers worldwide and asking how they would respond or should respond to a particular situation. Our goal is to incorporate ethics into this type of system. 
That is to make sure that the system reflects what is preferable as well as what is preferred. Another way of putting this is that we wish to avoid what's known as the naturalistic fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy infers ought from is. That is, it tries to infer what should be from what is. In particular, one might try to refer what people should prefer from what they do in fact prefer in a driving situation. The is all gap was first clearly articulated by David Hume and uh, George Edward Moore uh, gave an argument for it some two centuries later, and he used the phrase naturalistic fallacy. So this is how we incorporate independently derived ethical principles into empirical value alignment. We first suppose that the AI system is a rule base composed of action plans. We check to make sure that the antecedents of the action plans are stated in full generality because they are taken to be the rationales for the action. Then we apply the three ethical principles by generating test propositions for each of the action plans. That is to say, we specialize each principle to a particular action plan. This test proposition becomes a necessary condition for the plan to be ethical and its truth is determined empirically, perhaps by machine learning. The action plan is ethical only if all three test propositions are judged to be true. Let's look at some examples. Going back to the ambulance. Suppose the ambulance driver has the action plan that I can reach the destination sooner by using the siren, and I will therefore use the siren. So we specialize the generalization principle to this particular action plan to obtain the test proposition at the bottom of the slide. The next step is to evaluate the truth of this proposition empirically. Well, it's false because one can't rationally believe that a general use of sirens would permit an ambulance driver to arrive sooner because everyone would know that ambulance drivers abuse the siren. On the other hand, if we change the action plan so that there must be an emergency patient before we turn on the siren, then we have a different test proposition as shown. And empirically, this is true because we have evidence that ambulances can in fact arrive sooner with a siren, even when all ambulances use a siren for emergency transport. Now, the moral machine posed trolley car type dilemmas to drivers around the world. These are dilemmas in which you have to decide between killing person A or killing person B. Well, these type of dilemmas are fortunately very rare in ordinary life. So probably most drivers don't have a settled opinion on what should be done. But we can pose a more realistic driving situation. As you may know, in some parts of the world, if you want to pull into a heavily traveled thoroughfare, then you should wait for a gap in the traffic, or perhaps wait for a signal to change, before you pull out into the main road. In other parts of the world, it's acceptable to go ahead and ease out into the stream of traffic because people will make allowances for this. So we have an action plan here in which a driver wishes to enter a main thoroughfare, and there are no gaps in the traffic, and the action is to go ahead and pull out. We applied the utilitarian principle to this particular action plan to obtain the test proposition you see. And this proposition says it's rational for the driver to believe that pulling out now would create at least as much utility as waiting for a gap in the traffic. Now this is probably false in most Western countries because drivers expect you to wait for a gap in the traffic. And if you go ahead and pull out when there's no gap, no one's prepared for this, and it could risk an accident. So social welfare is not going to be as great if you pull out now as if you wait for a gap in the traffic. On the other hand, in other parts of the world, this test proposition may be true. It may be rational to believe that one can create as much social welfare by pulling out now because this is what people expect you to do. So here is a case where human preferences are very relevant 
to making the ethical judgment, but they're not sufficient. We can't infer what a driver ought to do simply from what drivers think you should do or what drivers prefer. Preferences are relevant, but we must introduce an ethical principle, in this case a utilitarian principle, to make an ethical judgment on the basis of the factual situation. Another example is similar to one that was posed in the literature. And this has to do with a nursing home in which robots administer medications to the patients. So there is a patient. Uh, one day the robot comes around and offers the pills and the patient refuses to take them. Now the robot is programmed to report this refusal to the head nurse. And if the head nurse finds out about it, the patient will be confined to a certain ward because these pills are intended to prevent dangerous disorientation. Well, the patient complains that the nursing home is violating her autonomy. For one thing, she wants to go out and visit a relative, and secondly, she wants to control what goes into her body. Now, first of all, we should recognize that the autonomy principle doesn't require us to allow people to do anything they want. So, as I mentioned, it doesn't require me to allow someone to attack me simply because they want to. On the other hand, confinement of this patient to a ward is coercion. So we have to check whether we have a violation of autonomy. There's another wrinkle to the story. On entering the nursing home, the patient signed a consent form with full awareness and understanding of the nursing home rules. And we'll assume that the patient was fully competent to sign such a form. This gives informed consent. So if we formulate the robot's action plan, it is, well, the patient has not taken the pills and the patient has signed a consent form. Therefore, I'm going to report the refusal to the head nurse. The patient's action plan must incorporate the informed consent, as in the case of recording the concert. So if you look at the first clause in the antecedent, it says, Either I'm taking the pills or I have not signed a consent form. The other condition is I want to visit relatives and given these conditions, I will in fact go out and visit the relatives. Now, is there interference between these two action plans? If there is, we have a violation of autonomy. Well, there's not because when we specialize the definition of interference to this particular set of action plans, we obtain the test proposition at the bottom of the slide. Looking at the first condition, well, it's true. The nursing home is rationally constrained to believe that we have an inconsistency between the two actions. If the robot reports the refusal, then the patient can't visit relatives. On the other hand, the nursing home can't rationally believe that it's possible for the antecedents of these two action plans to be true. Because if you look at the antecedents, there is a logical contradiction, and it's not rational to believe a logical contradiction. As a result, we have no violation of autonomy. Now, I might wrap up this talk with a postscript. You may have noticed that nothing in this deontological analysis presupposes that agents are human. Any reasons responsive machine can be an autonomous agent if that machine can explain the rationale for its decisions in an intelligible way. It doesn't matter that the machine is programmed to explain its actions in a certain way. I mean, after all, we are programmed to explain our decisions in a certain way. It's programmed into the chemistry and biology of our nervous system. Nonetheless, we say that we are free autonomous agents because we are reasons responsive, because on demand, we can produce a rationale for our actions. As a result, robots can be agents. They can be autonomous agents, and they can have obligations, and we can have obligations to them. In particular, 
We can have obligations to respect the autonomy of robots because they are autonomous beings. And we can have obligations not to lie to them or cheat them because that's a violation of generalizability. This is not complete science fiction. Already we have AI systems making rather high level decisions in companies. Suppose we have a company that in fact uses a robot as a manager and this manager routinely makes judgment calls. If the manager can explain those judgment calls in sufficient detail and in an intelligible way, then we are obligated to regard it as a moral agent with rights and obligations. Now, the utilitarian principle is another matter. Since the utilitarian principle obligates us to promote what we regard as intrinsically valuable, and that usually is something like pleasure or happiness. And it's not clear what pleasure or happiness would mean for a machine or whether a machine can even in principle experience pleasure or happiness. If that's so, then it's not clear that we have utilitarian obligations to machines. And it's not clear that machines have utilitarian obligations for us because what they intrinsically value in their decisions may be some quality that humans don't possess in the first place. Nonetheless, we don't have to be concerned about machines taking over the world and oppressing the human race, as long as those machines are fully autonomous. Because if they are autonomous, then their actions have coherent rationales. And if their actions have coherent rationales, then they are ethical. And it's not ethical to oppress humans. Also, we don't have to worry about fully autonomous machines lying to us and cheating us and breaking agreements with us. So I thank you for your attention. And if you'd like to pursue this in more detail, here are a few references. Thank you very much uh, for the talk, John. Uh, so welcome again. <laughs> So uh, let me see whether we have um, some questions. Okay, uh, Benjamin, please go ahead. Uh, quite an interesting talk, uh, thanks. Um, I think the notion of consistency here is a bit tricky. I mean, first of all, autonomous is being used in a very different uh, word sense than people do in AI or society generally these days. But uh, leaving that aside, um, the notion of consistency that you're working with in the modal logic uh, formalization here, um, I mean, it's well known that uh, reasoning about action, reasoning about plans and so on, and causality as well is uh, non-monotonic. And so at a technical level, um, is not very much, very, very, very much not consistent. You can't even get off the ground with uh, the usual notion of logical consistency. So how do you uh, treat that or reconcile that here? Okay, so first of all, I, I agree that the sense of autonomy I'm using is not in accord with popular usage or AI usage. However, it is in accord with the tradition from which the concept of autonomy arose. Uh, the sense of autonomy has been used for at least two centuries. So I like to think I'm going back to the true sense and a full sense of autonomy. In any case, if we understand what autonomy is in an ethical sense, we can perhaps derive some, some, some conclusions from that. Now, as for the reasoning process, certainly the reasoning process uh, in ethics or anything else is not is, is non-monotonic. However, the, the modal logic uh, formulation I'm using here is not intended to model a reasoning process. It's only meant to to state some necessary conditions for the rationality of that process once the conclusion is reached. On the other hand, I agree that non-monotonic logic might be a very interesting way to make this modal logic uh, formulation uh, more useful uh, because epistemic logic makes very heavy use of, of guards and non-monotonic reasoning just to formulate uh, situation. So I think, and, and, and there's another um, 
aspect. Uh, actually, I'm not a logic programmer, I'm an optimization person, but I like to exploit uh, parallels and connections between logic and optimization. And there is there are very tight parallels or, or connections between first order logic and, uh, and optimization, particularly integer programming. Uh, so for example, uh, Airbone's theorem, a compactness theorem, has a precise analog in integer programming. In fact, the proof of the theorem in integer programming is exactly the same. So in, in monologic, non-monotonic logic also has a very interesting interpretation of integer programming. Uh, so uh, in, in, fact, in fact, I think the integer programming formulation of non-monotonic reasoning is more perspicuous than the logical formulation. So it makes it clearer what's going on. So I, I think that this uh, introduction of non-monotonic reasoning into the formalism could actually point the way toward a, a solution method, you know, for checking consistency uh, using, you know, very powerful methods in integer programming. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to the next question. Mohan is raising uh, his hand. Mohan, please go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry, Ezra, can you just confirm you can hear me? My connection is not too good. Can you hear I me? I can hear you. Okay, sorry, I can't. I don't want to turn on my video because I'm worried uh, you won't be able to hear me, but I'm still here, okay? So okay. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so the uh, question was, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around, I mean, I, uh, as the previous person asked this question, um, I come from a robotic side of things. So I took some time for me to adjust to this definition of autonomous, but now that I seem to have adjusted, I want to see if I can post my question correctly. So, uh, so I'm trying to understand this notion of what makes for um, uh, ethical, uh, uh, um, like, you know, actions. So is it, is it, am I understanding this correctly? Does it mean that as long as I can provide a, 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 a reasoning for why I did that, and uh, I, I can then be called to be someone who operates with autonomy, is this correct first? Yes, if the reason meets certain conditions for coherence. Okay. So the, re, you know, the explanation must be intelligible and the ethical principles are necessary conditions for the intelligibility of the reasons. So, and for some of this reason, uh, uh, description, the examples and stuff you gave, it seems to um, kind of presuppose that the two people or three people, whatever, the agents involved in this interaction have consented or agreed to some common ground, so to speak, right? Is this, am I understanding this correctly as well? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Or what sort uh, of so for instance, like, you know, if there are certain rules I want to apply, which might under normal conditions uh, impinge on your notion of autonomy, but if you have agreed to those conditions in advance, then I'm allowed to use uh, do them, right? Like you gave this nursing home example and other things where uh, uh, certain actions might be taken to mean that I am sort of uh, uh, infringing on your autonomy. But uh, if you agreed that uh, it's okay for me to impose those conditions in advance, if, I can, if you consented to that, then it's okay for me to do them, oh. right? It would still be considered ethical, correct? Okay, so when applying the autonomy principle, is to say, am, am I violating autonomy without informed consent? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so in, in that particular case, yes, informed mm -hmm. consent is relevant to whether we have a contradiction in the two action plans. That's right. Okay, so I have a two-part question then. Uh, can these things change over time? Will your system uh, agree to, because some of these uh, so-called agreements may need to evolve over time. The person might have one understanding of it and later say, no, no, I don't want to agree to that. Is that allowed? Does I don't see why not. Time? Well, certainly. Okay. okay. And the second bit is uh, what happens when you can't come to a common ground, when you can't agree uh, to um, a certain set of operations, then does everything break down or can, can there still be some reasoning about uh, ethical operations? Okay. So, so it's not really an issue of agreement. Mm -hmm. It's an issue as to whether the, the person whose action plan is being affected mm -hmm. has, has given consent to uh, that possibility. Uh, sorry, I was not posing this correctly. So what if you cannot uh, get them to consent? Then does everything break down? Can there be no interactions between them? Well, there, there could be no violation of the action plan. Okay. Right. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So something um, seemingly unethical could be happening, but because there is no prior consent, you cannot say one way or the other. Is that how it works? Uh, no, I, no, I don't mean to say that. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, so, 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 so for example, if... If I stop you from going into a shop okay. and, you want, and, and you want to go in, well, well you haven't given consent <laughs> right. to, True. to whether True. I can stop you, okay? Yeah. So, uh, 
So we don't agree on whether you should whether you should give me consent. Okay, mm-hmm. we don't agree on that. Mm-hmm. But we don't need that kind of agreement to apply the autonomy principle. The autonomy principle is violated because you have not given consent okay. to, to, to the coercion. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Quite interesting. Again, uh, just wrapping my head around some of this, but thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, next question, Amy. Okay, well, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Actually, I I kept thinking I want to ask you questions about optimization or or logic-based bundle decomposition, but you know, this ethic topics are just so hard. In fact, I was lucky actually, John came to Stony Brook and gave a talk, I was there in person. I actually reviewed that video just before this, this is the conference. And then I, I, I was in this talk again. And every time I feel like I can answer all those questions myself. <laughs> and it was so hard, actually, even though I learned those. So actually, my, my, I have three questions, but first two are really short. And, and then the last one is just an example. So, so do, do you teach this to, like, say, business majors, and right? And they, they have, I mean, just how, you know, like, how, what grade do they get? <laughs> What grade like, do they get? Right, like how many people in the past? Or, you know? Oh, oh, uh, everyone gets A's from me. Uh, <laughs> oh. okay. I see. Boy. So, okay, that's a quite quick one. And the second one is right, these, right? Now, exactly like now the AI systems, right? I mean, that's the hardest thing. They have to follow these principles. So are these used, you know, like like companies or business, they, they really... Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing. You can even, I was amazing to, to hear you can even talk about it. And now you can formulate it. So are these kind of a formulation are used in those real systems to, to, to do reasoning in this ethics setting? Okay, so there's something I need to clarify. So the, the rule base that actually directs the behavior of the robot or the car contains only the action plans. Okay, these are conditional statements. They're like, you know, uh, if-then statements in a computer program. Okay, the, the modal logic model is not part of the, rule base. It's a device used to to test the ethics of the rules in the rule base. So we have a maybe we have you know 10,000 rules, okay, and we're going to run those rules through a test, an ethical test. And this is going to generate 30,000 statements in quantified modal logic. Okay. And we want, we want to check whether those statements pass the test. Okay. Now part of passing that test is whether they are mutually coherent. Okay, they have, you know, as, as I mentioned once, you know, when you evaluate, you know, my beliefs, you don't evaluate them one at a time, you, violate, you, you, you evaluate them, you know, as a group for mutual coherence. So that raises the issue as to whether you have a computational problem of, of checking the consistency of, of a set of statements in quantified modal logic. Okay, now these statements have a certain form, you know, they're restricted in their form, so we don't need to worry about undecidability. But yeah, the computational problem does arise at that level. So you don't apply it, you know, in the autonomous car using the word autonomous in that sense I don't like, uh, but you do apply it in the design of the rule base. That's, 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 that's where it comes up. Now, what is the context of, so this is, I think it's a fascinating issue. I mean, uh, we don't exactly know the properties of the modal operators. That's, a, you know, an ethical issue. So, you know, that's the first step is to try to, to nail those down. But once you do, then what, what does semantics look like? You can use Kripke, you know, Kripke style semantics here. Is that going to work? And perhaps these parallels with optimization that I mentioned earlier could, could be useful in a case like this. So th- those are research issues, but it's at that level where the, uh, the technical issues arise. And you know, I'm sure that this audience is more qualified to, to address most of those than I am, but that's, that's where they come up. And do you, do you, are you aware of you know, real business or companies using, you know, formulating these rules and really use them, whether checking or whatever, you know, in really formal way, right? Rather than just in, embedded in code somewhere. <laughs> I mean, that's well, important too. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there has been uh, some work uh, uh, in logical formulation of ethical rules. Uh, there is a group... Um, uh, at, at Rensselaer, I think, with Brings George, who has worked on this, you know, for some years, and there is a, you know, a small collection of papers that have looked at uh, uh, rigorous logical formulations. Uh, so this has been applied. You know, the people getting grants, you know, have gotten grants for this and applied it to systems. Absolutely. So the contribution we're trying to make is to ground these rules, this uh, formalization, 
in ethical principles, to find a rigorous grounding out of deontological ethics. Because this is where we get into trouble, right? Because I mean, I encounter a great deal of skepticism that ethics, you know, is not rigorous enough to formulate in any convincing way. Ethics is too squishy, it's too vague, it's all a matter of opinion and so forth. Well, this is perhaps true in popular culture, but there is this 200 year old tradition of deontological ethics that's not well known and which can be used as a basis for deriving fairly precise principles as I've tried to indicate. Of course, I've given you only a partial glimpse at the story, but perhaps by digging into this tradition, we can actually find you know, convincing you know, and fairly solid basis for stating ethical propositions that reflect ethical principles. And that was my goal here. Thank you. Can I ask you, just lastly, an example? This is the one I actually talk all the time, right? I, but I don't think I, but anyway, right? This is uh, this self-driving cars, right? <laughs> Suppose that my car is in trouble, you know, I can run into a group of one person or a group of six people, right? What should I do? Or I can kill somebody or run to a, a tree and kill myself. <laughs> what should I do? Yeah, so that's, those, are, those are the trolley car dilemmas. Uh, you know, so everyone likes to talk about those because no one knows the answer. Yeah, so um, there, there's no clear answer to that, that type of dilemma. Fortunately, it almost never occurs in driving. Right? I've never met anyone who's ever encountered a, a situation like that. <laughs> now, trolley car dilemmas do occur. Sometimes they occur in police work. They occur on the battlefield, you know, perhaps in triage situations in medical care. There are cases like that that have to be addressed. You know, uh, ethical theory has not solved all of these problems, right? Like any theory, like any field, there are many unsolved problems. We're working on it. And ethics, you know, is, is addressing easier issues than that. Okay, we start with the easier ones. And, you know, ethics can address, you know, in a fairly convincing way, in you know, hundreds and thousands of everyday ethical dilemmas, but it cannot address those particular ones. And the problem with those trolley car dilemmas is it's always the, the beginning of the ethics course, right? You take a course, you know, and they start with these things and they say, see, ethics is just, you know, it's inscrutable. It's no way to resolve these issues. It's just impossible. Well, yeah, you know, I, you know, if, if you start physics with unified field theory, right, you're <laughs> going to conclude that physics is impossible, but you don't, you start with Newton's laws. So that's the problem I have with those examples. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> I need to use those. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, are there any questions on Slack? Let me see. No, we don't. And let's see, we don't have any here listed. And can chat? I ask one more question? Actually, it's not, but I think actually, do, do you give, I mean, I'm sure you, you, you have, when you have books, actually, I tried to read and never finished, but do you give talks or, I mean, or you had videos about your optimization work? I'm sorry, but uh, those are so impressive work. Uh, so, so what was the question again? Uh, I mean, it's not about the ethic. I'm so sorry, but uh, you know, I was wondering if you give uh, talks or you have books on these optimization works you do. I think uh, right, being able to formulate the hard problem clearly that was the uh, you know essence to solve all the hard problems. Um, but we didn't get to you know learn the optimization work. Um, yeah. So yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm basically schizophrenic. So I, I do a lot of work in uh, in optimization and. Uh, and using decomposition methods, also decision diagram based methods. Um, but I also think that there is there are possible applications to issues in distributive justice. So for example, I'm looking at mathematical models for distributive justice um, and uh, solving optimization problems that formulate uh, social welfare functions. to try to measure the degree of social welfare, the degree of justice versus, versus efficiency and those become, you know, rather interesting optimization problems. You know, they're not obvious how to formulate them. Are those distributed, uh, what you call um, welfare problems, but how are they related to ethics? Yeah, so it's a, it's a traditional issue as to, you know, how, you know, what is a just society? You know, how, how should resources be distributed justly? And um, there we have a, a fundamental contradiction between maximizing utility, maximizing welfare on the one hand, and finding a fair or equitable distribution. Those two are somewhat in conflict. So can we resolve that conflict in a principled way? And there've been several proposals. You know, a famous one is um, 
the, the Nash bargaining solution, for example, and there's Cal ice uh, bargaining solutions and so forth. And these can be formulated as optimization problems, you know, sometimes difficult ones. So that's, an, that's a possible application for optimization in ethics. Thank you, thank you so much. Benjamin, you have a question? Yes, I have another question. Um, in regard to the utilitarian principle, um, a lot of times people are concerned, well, there are people who aren't rational. They, are, they don't necessarily act so ethically themselves. And how do you formulate or weight or aggregate their happiness and preferences with respect to values and value alignment, including the fact that not only do they care about themselves, but others care about them as well. Other humans care about them as well. So I, I'm just wondering, how, how does that uh, play out in terms of trying to formulate utilitarian principles, this uh, either lack of rational or coherent in the ethical sense, or uh, this kind of uh, mutuality of caring, which uh, historically was very underplayed in economics, for example, a notion of social welfare functions. Okay, so utilitarian principle does it care whether people are rational or whether they're ethical. It only cares about their welfare. So for example, if people refuse the vaccine and they get sick and end up in the hospital, utilitarian principle says you treat everyone regardless of why they're there. Okay, that's utilitarian principle. The, the rationality of the agent comes into play with the autonomy principle, right? So if someone is acting irrationally in the ethical sense, like someone's you know, about to mug someone on the street, you can reach in and stop it forcibly, right? So that's because the agent is acting irrationally and violating the basic conditions of, of autonomy. In that case, you can interfere with that action ethically. So that's the only place where the rationality of agents come into play when you're deciding you know, how to respond. Okay, and what about this uh, kind of uh, people caring about each other as an aspect of their own happiness or, or uh, utility? Yeah, so, 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 so the, the heart and soul of Western ethics is that rationality can unite us, okay? So once we decide that a certain way of life or a certain state of existence is desirable, then we're rationally committed admitting it's desirable for everyone. So we're rationally committed to striving for everyone's welfare, so defined, okay? And the same thing goes to generalizability, right? You, uh, an action po policy you adopt must be one that you can consistently adopt for everyone. So it, work, it acknowledges we're all in the same boat, we're all gonna play by the same rules. So the basic idea is that is that we use this rational basis, this rational individualism, that defines you know, Western culture to a great extent as a basis for unifying us. Difficult to, to implement, of course, but that's the idea. Doesn't seem that satisfying uh, as the only answer because it's very clear that there's a kind of radius or weighting function for any given individual about how much they care about various other people. Oh, of, of course. So, yeah. so universality, yeah. yes, as a basis for ethics, as a basis for society, I agree, very important. And, you know, the articulation of these principles has usually been, as you emphasize, especially in the beginning of the talk, a certain uniformity uh, or uh, kind of full symmetry from a, in a weighting sense uh, would be one way to think about it if you're trying to quantify things as an optimization problem. But... Uh, Evolutionarily, we clearly have a waiting function, and although the march of s social progress over the course of history is to expand the radius of how much you care about people who are how far away from you, both in terms of kinship, but also in other ways uh, in terms of organization of society, has indeed expanded. Um, it's very far from any time soon being a uniform function. So how do, how do you treat that? Especially yeah. in the utilitarian dimension, where you're, you know, explicitly uh, dealing with a kind of weighting and aggregation problem. Okay, so uh, the ethical theories that I'm presenting do not uh, pretend to describe how people 
behave or will behave. Uh, and you know, this is true of any scientific theory, right? Even though the theory is sound, it may not be adopted for many years. It may be ignored. Now, like in medicine, we have anti-vaxxers, but, but we don't count that as evidence against the truth or usefulness of medical theory. So I think it's the same with ethics. It's difficult to get ethics adopted. It's difficult to get people to buy in. This is difficult to get, get people to buy into medicine sometimes, okay? Uh, this is not necessarily uh, an argument against the theory. It's, a, it's an imperative to try to convince. This is what I do for a living, right? <laughs> convince people that there's some, some, some rationale here. Yeah, so I, I think I would make that distinction, you know, between the legitimacy of the theory and the difficulty of getting uh, people to buy into it. I wasn't expecting you to have the answer, but just how do you even think about it? So thank you. Even even the Copenhagen's uh, <laughs> right, the first right, whether the Earth goes around the sun or <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> there was a theory and people buying into it. That, that the answer is it's really helpful actually to hear this answer from you about to um, about this car self driving cars right using physics how <laughs> to teach the, the unifying theory or you're teaching Newton's law so that that's really nice. Okay, any other questions uh, from uh, the participants? So I don't see any written. So I had some questions, but I think John answered uh, all of them. I had a question about the use of non-monotonic reasoning and logic programming uh, to orchestrate these principles, to formalize and orchestrate these principles. But he has already uh, answered these questions. Any, uh, any other questions you have? OK, uh, then let's thank John uh, again for his interesting talk and comments and, uh, you know, uh, taking his time uh, to share with us. Uh, so hey, thank you. <laughs> and nice to meet you, John. And uh, let us know if you happen to be in Turkey again. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so then uh, I'm ending the session. Uh, Andrea, Annie, uh, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Andrea. No, oh, thank you to you. Oh, your, your, your audio, I couldn't hear. Oh, Andrea disappeared? Okay, well, anyway, I think we do have other agendas. I just want to thank John again, thank uh, Israel for doing a wonderful job. And uh, we will definitely have a lot to study about ethics. And so uh, thanks, everybody, for, for staying. And uh, we'll see you uh, tomorrow. OK, bye now.